Let's try and make church a place where it's really safe to talk about these things. Let's not have a kind of ingrained pecking order. What Jesus says in Matthew 5 implicates every single one of us. So, so none of us should be feeling, you know, good or superior. Welcome to the Calvary Podcast. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global. Well, it's wonderful to have you in our Sunday evening service at Calvary tonight. And we are delighted to be hearing from Sam Albury. Uh, Sam is an author, uh, speaker and apologist who speaks right around the world. Uh, he's the author of a number of excellent books, uh, including Is God Anti-Gay? Uh, Seven Myths About Singleness and What God Has to Say About Our Bodies. Uh, Sam is also the associate pastor at Emmanuel Church in Nashville, uh, is a canon theologian for the Anglican Church, but aren't we all? And uh, is also a fellow at the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics. Sam, welcome to Calvary. Hey, it's so good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Absolute joy. Now, everyone has already picked up your accent. So where are you from and where do you reside now? Yeah, from England, as you can tell, I'm a pom uh, and... Grew up in the south of England, just outside London, um, and I've been in, living over here in Nashville for the last about three years or so, something like that. Okay, okay. Now, a, a quick get to know you, because it's your first time speaking at Calvary, so everyone's wondering yeah. who is this Englishman living in America. So um, let me just fire a few questions at you. Uh, who was your childhood hero? Um, I think when I was like... Nine or ten, it would have been Marty McFly from the Back to the Future movies. Uh, he was the epitome of cool for me growing up. So he could ride a skateboard, he could hold on to the backs of cars. I, you know, uh, so he, he was my my hero from that point of view growing up. Um, I don't think I'd quite come, you know, I, hadn't, I didn't really have a developed category of true heroes that I should be, you know, guys who were off fighting evil or that kind of stuff. I didn't really have that category in place just yet. So probably Indiana Jones would be a close second. <laughs> two, two very good candidates. And uh, your, I think so. your ideal holiday destination? Uh, is uh, the Scottish Highlands. Yeah, the further north and west, the better. Love it up there. Beautiful. Greatest movie of all time? A Few Good Men. Um. It's a Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson movie. It's a courtroom drama about a, a naval uh, court martial, but it's, I love it. I've always loved that movie. Classic, good taste. Uh, the ideal day off for you? The ideal day off would be a combination of hiking with a, with a good friend, uh, seeing a movie uh, and having a nice meal and maybe playing a couple of games of something. Sounds good. Now, which is the better nation to live in, Britain or America? Yeah, I don't know. That, that's a horrible question to ask because you're basically asking me to either offend 65 million people or 350 million people. Um, hey, but just, just so you know, Australians and South Africans, we're happy to offend Americans or British people. So go for your life. Well, I know that. Um, I've been around <laughs> enough of you. Uh, there are things that I really miss the... In it, the thing about living in England is you can walk to places. Uh, I miss being in a walkable context. I miss hiking in British countryside. Uh, there's lots of things I love about being in America, but probably living in England has the edge on a, on a few fronts. Okay. And you're living in Nashville. What's the, the, the greatest thing about living in Nashville? Um, completely honestly, it's the church I'm at. That's why I'm here. Um, I, right. I walked into this church in 2018 and immediately felt like I'd come home. Um, and oh, I love Nashville as it turns out, but I, I moved here for the church and, um, Nashville's a great place as well, it turns out. Um, but I wouldn't be here were it not for the church. And that's for me is the best thing about being here. That's a great reason to be there. And then the fried yeah. chicken, fried chicken would be second. <laughs> I'm glad that's second and not first, but completely understandable. Yeah, I have to think about it for a moment though. Yeah. I just had yeah, lunch, so I'm okay. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Now, um, we're tonight talking about uh, the topic of same-sex attraction and faith. And when I announced to our church uh, a few weeks back that we're going to be talking about same-sex attraction and gay relationships, there was almost a, 
uh, an audible gasp almost in church because it's become such a contentious and controversial issue in our culture. Um, can you maybe give us your thoughts on why the topic of same-sex attraction and gay relationships has become almost the moral issue of our day and certainly one of the greatest problems people have with their perception of the Christian message? Yeah, there's, there's probably several answers to that question, but the thing that, that I think is most significant is in our culture, your sexuality has become who you are. And the highest virtue in our culture right now is being true to yourself, um, living out your identity and the importance of that being affirmed and received by everybody else. And so mm. when they hear Christians saying, you know, certain forms of sexual practice are sinful, we might think we're saying, oh, well, I disagree with certain forms of behavior. What people are hearing is you are rejecting who somebody is at their core being. Um, so it's it's kind of the unforgivable sin in our culture today is to not affirm someone's sexual identity because that's the most significant thing about them and you're, you're dehumanizing them, you are, uh, you're crushing their mental health and their sense of worth. And therefore the kind of traditional Christian understanding of sexuality is, is now seen as dangerous in our culture for that reason. Right. I'm, I'm going to ask you a little later in our conversation about the topic of identity, because I'd love to hear your thoughts mm. on that. Um, but before yeah. we do, I guess just to give some context uh, to our church and everyone joining us tonight around your journey, uh, you've mm. written and spoken widely about your journey, um, I believe in your late teens, um, coming to terms with feelings of same-sex attraction and and the, the the journey of faith and life that you walked from there. Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about that. What were some of your hopes, fears, experiences in that journey? Um, would you mind sharing that? I'd be very happy to. So I, I was uh, a teenager in the early and mid 90s. Um, so it was a very different context to the one in which we, we live now. Um, but as you say, I became aware that I was attracted to to other guys rather than to girls. Around the time I was, I don't know, 15, 16, 17, it was a, it was a slow process. I'm a slow learner. So it took me a while to figure out what was going on. And given it was the early nineties, um, that wasn't an exciting realization. That was a frightening one because being homophobic was, was normal in my peer group, in my school. Um, and therefore I didn't see this development as being a good thing. This was just going to make life harder for me. Um, it was going to complicate friendships it was going to put a target on me socially and so my my hope was that no one would ever know um, that i could just somehow write this out come out the other end of it somehow without kind of having to to be dragged through the fire of uh of bullying and all the rest of it um this was all before i became a christian um i was then beginning to think okay maybe when i move away and go to university uh, that's the norm in the UK. You go and study somewhere else. Um, I knew that universities I was looking at had, L that in those days, LGB societies. So I was thinking, okay, there's there's already people out there who have a category for this. Maybe I can explore it then and no one else at home would need to know. Um, that was my original plan. And then I, I, I became a Christian. That hadn't been part of my plan, but that happened. <laughs> And so from then on, I was obviously thinking, okay, well, now I'm a follower of Jesus. I need to, to follow whatever he says about these things. So you've kind of hinted that you didn't come from a faith background. How did you then come to faith in Jesus? And I'm curious, how do you then reconcile this newfound faith in Jesus with the feelings that you're feeling on the inside around same-sex attraction? Yeah. yeah, I didn't I didn't grow up going to church or really thinking about spiritual things at all. Um but I had a couple of good friends who were who were Christians and they invited me to their church youth ministry. I said no lots of times because I wasn't that interested. But when I finished um I finished school and finished those final exams and had nothing else to do for the summer. So when they said, Hey, come along to our youth group, I couldn't think of any reason not to, didn't have anything else to do. So I went along and I heard the gospel for the first time, began to realize who Jesus really was, why he really did come, um, 
began to quickly see the implications for for me as as someone who didn't know the Lord and and was spiritually lost. Um, and so quickly began to realize that I was someone who needed the forgiveness that Christ had come to bring. Um, Can I ask you a so quick that, question there, Sam? I, yeah, yeah, of course. Was what you what you heard when you turned up to that youth group or that church about the message of Jesus, was what you heard what you had assumed the message of Jesus was? Or was there a difference between what you thought Jesus said and then actually what the Jesus of the Bible actually yeah. teaches? I, there was a very significant difference. I, I had sort of somehow come up with the idea that Christianity was about God congratulating good people. And Jesus came along to, to kind of tell us to do a bit better. Um, but that, that, that was basically the message. Um, do better, try harder. Um, and so what I was beginning to hear was actually, you know, Jesus is, is all about coming to find people who are lost, people who don't know God. Um, and I began to realize, oh, that's me. I, I have no idea who, who my creator is. Um, right. If there's a God out there who made me, I don't know him. Therefore, I am I'm lost. So right. that was that was what began to draw me to to Christ was that, that sudden realization of oh this is what Christianity is, um, and that was far more compelling to me. And then in terms of what that then meant for my sexuality, um, what it meant was as a new believer, I wanted to follow Jesus. Um, I knew that He was worthy of every part of my life, and so. Part of my early months and years of discipleship was thinking through, okay, what does this mean for my sexuality? And beginning to realize that Jesus has opinions on this, this kind of stuff. Um, he wasn't silent. He wasn't neutral. Um, but I did what, what really helped me was as I began to unpick what Jesus taught about sexuality, I, it was immediately apparent to me, oh, this is challenging for everyone. Um, he's not singling me out here. He's just at a species level challenging us and convicting us and, and humbling us and, and making claims about our hearts and where our hearts are at and, and why we need him in this in this area of life. Can, can we flow into that part of the conversation then? Um, a lot of people who are maybe unfamiliar with church or unfamiliar with the Bible or the teachings of Jesus may think, well, if Jesus talked about sex, he must have just singled out same-sex attracted people and really, because, you know, yeah. that seems to be the thing that, you know, Christians are notorious for singling out. Yeah. Uh, what what did Jesus actually teach about sexuality? And and is it good news? Is it bad news? C can you, for, for the person who doesn't know much about the Bible, could you in a few minutes maybe summarize what Jesus taught about sexuality? Yeah, I will, I will attempt to, and, and uh, anyone who is unfamiliar with that message would do well to then look it up <laughs> and, sure. and hear it from his lips, not not mine. Um, but you're right. Um, if if one assumption is, well, if he has anything to say, he's going to be bashing the gay folks. Another assumption from another group of people is, well, Jesus is neutral on this. He has nothing to say. He's just go with the flow. Doesn't matter. You do you. Neither of those views is is correct. When you when you see what Jesus says, he has a lot to say about sexuality, but he's not. He doesn't mention homosexuality. Yeah. So what he's saying about sexuality, he's saying to every single one of us. And the key text is is Matthew five twenty seven twenty eight in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, "You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, part of the Old Testament law, but I say to you." Anyone who looks at someone with lustful intent has already committed adultery in their heart. So Jesus is basically saying that the natural grain of the human heart is to go against God's design for our sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, in the Bible, sexuality is meant to be a form of, of expressing a, a, a lifelong covenant with someone. It's a form of self-giving. Um, it's a form of self-donation. You're, you're saying to someone, my, my body is now is now yours. Um, what we've done is we flipped it and we've turned it into a form of taking and saying, well, this is my sexual appetite. What can I take that will satisfy it? 
And at that point, at that level, it doesn't really make any difference what kind of attractions you have, whether you're attracted to men or women or both or neither. The fact is we're, we're not naturally in our hearts lining up with what our sexuality has been given to us for. And so Jesus is, is challenging everyone there. He, he doesn't sort humanity into people who are straight and then people who aren't and then have a different message for each. His, his message is, is humbling for all of us, but, but also hopeful. Um, he doesn't just come to say, hey, this is, this is where your heart has gone awry. He comes to say, I've come to give you a new heart. And so whatever mess we discover down there, and we discover there's mess there in, in every part of our lives, Jesus is saying, I've come to help you with that. He's not just come to browbeat and say, hey, this is where you've got it all wrong. He's come to say, guys, you, you need to know what your heart is like. Right. And that that's why I'm here. Um, right. To, to put you back together again, um, to give you grace and forgiveness and redemption, uh, to pay the price for our the way we we misuse every part of our humanity and to make us new in him. So right. is it good news? Is it bad news? It is. It's amazing news, but it's, it's amazing news that isn't convenient um, because it is it's saying, actually, we, we do need to come to terms with the way that we are. Yeah. But having done that, man, this is, this is extraordinary news. Right. Um, the, the scripture that you quoted earlier, Jesus saying, you know, don't commit adultery, um, don't even go there in your heart. Some may say or make the argument, well, Jesus was arguing against having non-committal relationships. You know, so long as it's a lifelong covenant, it doesn't really matter if it's same sex or opposite sex. Um, you know, if it was a lifelong committed covenant relationship that happened to be a same sex relationship, wouldn't Jesus smile upon that because he was against the infidelity, the adultery? Um, how would you respond to that? It's a, it's a common argument that yeah. is put forward. How would you respond to that? Yeah, it's a very, very understandable question. I, I think the answer is that Jesus is, is more, um, it, he's not as easy as that <laughs> on lots of fronts. So yes, he, he, he wants us in a covenant relationship, not simply a, uh, kind of something that is, is selfish or, or fleeting. Um, but the kind of covenant relationship he wants us in is quite specific um, mm. because, again, he's not saying anything that goes on within a, a relationship called marriage is okay. You can still be lustful. You can be abusive within a marriage. Mm. So it's not just that you've, you've locked someone into a covenant and then, okay, now you get to do anything you want. Even within the covenant of marriage, there is clear guidance on how you are to regard the other person's sexuality, how you are to steward your own. So we don't just get a pass when we get a marriage certificate. But then more than that, Jesus has a very particular definition of, of marriage that he's running with that is hard for us in the West. And talking to, to brothers and sisters in, in other parts of the world, it's hard in other cultures for different reasons because mm -hmm. Jesus actually gives us a definition of marriage in Matthew 19, which is that it is between one man and one woman and lifelong. Mm. That hits every culture in the world in a different way. For right. some of my African friends, that it's the fact that it's one man and one woman is countercultural. Right. Uh, for, for some people, the fact that it's meant to be lifelong, this is not just a, a kind of contract for as long as you feel like it. That's very countercultural for us as we are in the in the present time in the Western world, the idea that it's one man and one woman and not two men or two women or three people, that's countercultural. And it helps to know that I'm not I'm not diminishing the, the offense of what Jesus says there, but it is useful to know that his definition of marriage has always been offensive. Right. It's a very good the, point. the various reasons for the offense have changed over time and are different in different parts of the world. But there's no one culture that is kind of like, oh, yep, yep, that's exactly the definition we came up with. Right. Um, so it's not just that his definition of marriage is inconvenient for people who would want to be in a same-sex partnership. It's it's inconvenient for every one of us in different ways. Right, right. Now, um, earlier in our conversation, you started to touch on the topic of identity. 
And uh, I've read in one of your books that rather than describe yourself as a gay man, you describe yourself as a same-sex attracted man because your attraction is not fundamental to your identity. Uh, can you can you unpack your line of thinking there and maybe just tease that out a little bit more? Yeah, I can try to. And I'm aware that different terms have different associations and resonances in different alone, places. Yeah. So, um, but in terms of my own understanding of myself, uh, my my resistance to using the word gay of myself is that in my experience, as I hear the word being used by other people, it typically means far more than just, oh, the sexual attract attractions I happen to experience are towards the same sex. It tends to say much more than that. It tends to mean, and I'm okay with that, and I'm happy to run with that. And actually, that's that's the biggest thing about who I am, and that's my identity. Yeah. Um, I just don't believe any of those things. Um, I recognize that there are those attractions, um, those proclivities, but I don't want to give them star billing in who I am because I don't think that reflects a Christian understanding of who I am. My my humanity is so much more than just the type of sexual feelings I happen to experience. And mm -hmm. as a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, I'm I'm not defined by by sinful desires. I'm defined by by Him and being His. Mm -hmm. um, so I I don't want to give my my sexuality more prominence than it's than it than it merits and that's that's difficult today because again in our culture sexuality is seen as one of the key ways of understanding who you are um, and we do put it front and center culturally um mm. so trying to articulate the type of sexual desires one experiences whilst also saying and that actually is relativized by my understanding of what it means to be a christian it's hard to say those two things because uh, yes. people hear from the former part that, oh, you're a gay person then. And I want to say, well, no, because that's that's it's not who I am. It's part of what I might feel. It's not part of who I am. Um, and all of our feelings are tainted by sin. And all of our feelings we need to bring under the 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 loving care of, of Jesus and say to him, listen, help help me with these, help me with these these feelings that I'm feeling, whether it's sexual feelings, whether it's it's desires, yearnings, dreams, ambitions, frustrations, jealousies, whatever it is, we want to bring all of it under Christ. And we, our, our belief as Christians is it's so much better when we do, um, right. because He is He is able to help us sort through them and help us, you know, focus on what is good and and try and turn away from what is what is not. Right. Now, can I um, follow that? line of conversation around feelings and processing those feelings, uh, mm -hmm. there'll be people in our services this evening uh, who have experienced same-sex feelings, same-sex attraction, mm -hmm. maybe frequently and constantly, or maybe just every now and then, um, but perhaps mm -hmm. have, have never spoken to anyone and are embarrassed about it and not sure what to do with it and full of fear about what might happen if they talk to somebody. Um, could, mm -hmm. could you talk to people in church this evening who have got a desire to follow Jesus and understand Jesus' teaching, but are also trying to figure out what do I do with these feelings? Could you give some wisdom to people who are in that space? I, I will try to. Let, let me begin by saying something to everybody else first, which is before I say what I, I want to say to those people who are, are experiencing this themselves, for everybody else, let's try and make church a place where it's really safe to talk about these things. Mm. Um, let's, let's not have a kind of ingrained pecking order where we think, well, my, my sexual sins are heterosexual, therefore they're okay. But another person's sins might be homosexual and therefore they're really bad. Um, again, what Jesus says in Matthew five implicates every single one of us. So, so none of us should be feeling, you know, good or superior about our own sexual temptations and desires. So all of us, according to Jesus, are in the same boat. And we will have really varied temptations, desires, proclivities in this area, um, but we're all ultimately in the same boat. We, we all need him in this area of life. So if we can make that a sort of baseline felt reality in our fellowships, 
We want to make it so that people feel able to share and to confess any kind of sexual sin that they may be struggling with. That includes the person who's who's wrestling with same sex attraction. It includes the the, the straight person who's who's looking at porn um, and is also feeling like, man, if anyone else knows about this, I'm that could be that could be game over in, in this church. We we all need to be able to share what's going on under uh, under the surface in our lives. Yeah. For those who are wrestling with same sex attraction uh, specifically, I would just say we're not designed to deal with these things on our own. We need team fellowship um, around us. We need some believers who are who we are letting in on what's going on, people who can pray for us and encourage us and walk alongside us. That doesn't mean being public and open with the whole church. It just means we need some people who are mm. who are in our corner rooting for us, helping us to follow Jesus. Every Christian needs that. Um, but I, I have found that the single most significant blessing for me in, in my own journey with this is just having brothers alongside me who who know, who get it, um, don't experience it themselves necessarily to, to be able to really help and encourage. Mm. And actually what I found is those, those then become mutual because as I started to share some of my kind of stuff with them, they started to be open about some of the stuff they wrestle with. And that, that kind of started to open my eyes to, Oh, wow. Okay. So you guys have your own kind of crazy going on here. Um, right. And it, it's a way of making the, the gospel more real, mm. more believable. Um, so I would, I would make that the, the, my single most important piece of advice is to, is to have some other Christians who, who know how to pray for you on this and know how to encourage and, and help you. Right. It's a brilliant response. Um, there'll be other people, Sam, in church tonight who have no lived experience of feeling same-sex attraction. So just could not relate at all no. and don't know, you know, even how to empathise or what to say or are scared to say anything. So just avoid the topic. Yeah. Well, and, and out of a motive of love, they, they don't want to inflict hurt, yeah. so they just don't do anything. Uh, I want to ask you two questions there, and forgive me if this first one is a little bit personal, but in your journey of seeking to live out your faith and, and wrestle with these attractions, can you share what's been the hardest parts of that journey? Maybe would you be willing to share that just to give some understanding to people who have got no lived experience? Yeah, happy to. With the with the proviso that it, it's different for different people, and so my my own experiences are not oh okay that's how every same sex you know attracted struggler is feeling or whatever it might be. Um, it's it's varied. So there have been seasons where the most painful thing for me was loneliness. There have been other seasons where the most painful thing for me was just the the wretchedness of some of the the things going on in my own heart and my own sinfulness. Um, mm. There have been up other seasons where the most painful part of this process has been seeing friends walk away from Jesus because of it. Um, that's That's been agonizing and, and heartbreaking. So it's varied from season to season. Um, but it's it's been, with all of that, it's just been wonderful. Um, and one of the things I've realized is that whatever pains have attended this particular aspect of my discipleship, every believer has some kind of pain in their lives. Jesus says all of us are, are denying ourselves and taking up our cross. So everyone is dealing with something. Uh, mm -hmm. Most Christians are, are dealing with something that is is deeply painful in their own lives. And so... I don't feel like I've I've got a worse deal than anybody else or that I'm suffering more than anybody else at all. Um, and I hope my own pain has made me more empathetic to others. But for the Christian who has no experience of this and is thinking, I don't know, I have no, no idea what to say. I've got no experience. My, my closest friends are not people who wrestle with this. Mm -hmm. And they didn't need to be to be good friends. And they, they just know enough about their own sin to know how to feel about someone else's. And so right. they may have no experience of the particular sins I might struggle with, 
but they know what it's like to have sexual desires they don't want to have. They know what it's like to have a heart that just instinctively veers in the wrong direction at, at certain given moments. Mm. And so they, they can, they can have compassion and they can have grace. Uh, if they need to, they can, they can kind of challenge me if, if, you know, and I can receive all of that. Um, they don't need to have been in my specific circumstances to help me. Um, they just need to, to know, yeah, I'm a fully believer. We're in the same boat here. My, my own struggles are different to yours, but there's enough commonality here. There's enough solidarity that they, they can be real brothers um, in that. Right. The other thing I, I would say to the Christian who, who's thinking, well, I, I don't know enough about what this is like is there are some really wonderful books out there where people have shared their stories. So, mm. or videos online, but so, so take a look at a handful of those. Um, not, not everyone's story is the same, but, but listen to two or three and think, oh, okay, I can, begin to see what this can be like for some people. Yeah. Um, Sam, as you said at the start of the conversation, our culture is sex obsessed. Your sexuality has become your identity. And in the midst of that culture, singleness is seen as almost like the worst plight. Uh, God forbid that you would live a life of celibacy. I mean, how could you ever inflict that upon anybody? Um, you've written about singleness. Uh, what have you learned about living a fulfilled single life? And what have you learned about some of the myths, particularly in Christian circles that can get pushed around regarding marriage and singleness? Yeah, I think the most significant thing is both marriage and singleness are good gifts from God. And both of them are hard gifts from God. Um, I don't know any healthy marriage that hasn't involved painful seasons and, and struggles and battles of, of one kind or another. Um, I know that friends of mine who are married, you know, trying to be a faithful husband is not easy, um, not because of the other person, but because of themselves. And so what we mustn't do as single people is think, well, people who, who are married, that's just easy. And they, they get to walk in the park and that's every everything's sunshine and roses for them. But as for me, I've got to fight my temptations i've got to wrestle with no everyone has to do that um when you get married among other things what you're doing is exchanging the problems of singleness for the problems of marriage um, oh, i won't amen to that sam because it might get me <laughs> <laughs> uh, i wouldn't write that in your anniversary card but uh i mean there are blessings that come with with becoming married of course there are and there are blessings that are unique to being single um mm. So there are ups and downs of both and we need to be realistic. And I'm, I'm so grateful for married friends who, who let me into both the joys and sorrows of, mm. of married life. Um, I, I need to know about both. Um, mm. I think the other thing is that in our culture, especially, and, and therefore this has bled into the church significantly, we've narrowed our category of intimacy effectively to, to the point where the only real intimacy we we know of is romantic intimacy. And therefore, if you're not experiencing romantic intimacy, it's easy to think you're not experiencing any intimacy. And therefore, that being romantically uninvolved means being profoundly lonely. Um, that is the lived experience of a lot of people in our world, in the mm. Western world especially. It's sadly the experience of people in... in some of our churches, it should not be the norm in our churches because actually the New Testament is calling us into far broader categories of intimacy, whether we're married or single. Um, the mm. church is meant to be not just a family in name, but in, in felt actuality. And so friendship is, is something we're meant to be investing in and celebrating and championing in our churches and the kind of friendship the bible talks about when it talks about friendship is friendship that is intimate not mm. romantically not sexually but emotionally um a, a friend in the bible is someone who really knows your soul and so i have not needed to be married to feel deeply deeply known and loved um Marriage is a, is a unique way of feeling deeply known and loved, but it's not the only way. Um, 
And even if there's a, a depth of intimacy I don't get to experience by not being married, the flip side is there is a breadth of intimacy I get to experience by having a, a greater capacity for a, a wider range of, of deep friendships. So it's helped me to see that and to, to experience that. But I'm I'm aware that that's an underdeveloped category in, in many of our churches that we we we're still not elevating, facilitating, championing friendship as the Bible mm. speaks of friendship. Mm. That's a, a beautiful response. Um, if if I was to walk up to you in a coffee shop and I hear that you're a Christian and, you know, worse than that, you're a pastor and a theologian. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I think I'm going to ask my question and just point blank, I ask you, is God anti-gay? How do you respond to that question? My, my answer would be if there's no hope for our gay friends, there's no hope for anyone. Um, in other words, whatever our issue is, we're, we're in the same boat, humanity wide. Mm. And yet, Jesus is offering us life in him. Mm. So he's not fundamentally anti anyone that he's offering himself to. There may be lots of things we, we do that he has, you know, he, he would say is sinful and wrong. Um, but for as long as we are being offered life in Jesus, um, we can't say God is against us. Right. I'm, I'm going to finish with um, a quote from one of your books, uh, which I'd love you to just expand upon a little bit and then maybe pray for us before we close our conversation tonight. Um, as we've said, many people assume that Christianity is just bad news for same-sex attracted people. But one part of your book stood out to me. You said, as someone who lives with such feelings, I have found biblical Christianity to be a wonderful source of comfort and joy. I think comfort and joy are probably some of the last things that same-sex attracted people expect to find in faith in Jesus. Can you explain what you mean by that and then maybe close by praying for everyone in church tonight? Yeah, what I mean by it is I hope what, what each of us is is able to find in the gospel. There is there is deep consolation in Jesus. Uh, we, we are aware of our sinfulness. We're aware of our brokenness. Uh, sometimes we, we are mourning the fact that we are the very people we are. And in the Bible, we, we see repeatedly God draws near to the brokenhearted. And so as we feel brokenhearted about our own sinfulness, we find unusual comfort, grace, tenderness from Jesus. At the very point he should be withdrawing from us, he's actually moving closer to us. Um, that is just astonishing. That is not the, the God most people have in their imaginations when they think of God. Uh, but a God who, at those points in our life, at those points in our character, especially draws near to us in in love and tenderness and grace. Um, yeah. That is where I found comfort. No, there, there's more grace and forgiveness in Jesus than there is mess in me. Uh, there have been seasons in my life where I thought, I wonder if I might be a bit too much for him. And where it's as if he's he's looked me in the eye and said, Sam, you're not that special. Um, there is there is all that I need and more in him. Um that has been just a, a, a sweet comfort every day. Um uh and I that that sh that won't be unique to me. Beautiful. Would you pray for us, Sam? I would love to. Father, we we're so grateful for all that we we have in Jesus. We thank you for his love. We thank you for his grace. We thank you for his, his insightfulness, for his clarity, um, for his truth, for all that he says to us. Uh, we pray that you would help us to keep giving ourselves to him, to keep receiving him, um, to keep trusting him, to keep walking with him. Give us wisdom in, in these particular conversations. Lord, help us to be careful with one another. Uh, to be gentle, to be clear, to be thoughtful, to be gracious. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Hey, Sam, we really appreciate um, not just your time, but your honesty and your insight this evening. So thank you very much. It's a, such a privilege to be with you. Thank you for having me. For more information about a Calvary campus near you or to join us online, visit our website, calvarycc.global.